Good day, pirate brethren. So this is going to be kind of a new style video for me on Skull and Bones today. I am going to be kind of giving you guys a look behind the curtain at how I play the game. I um, just want to kind of uh, prefix this conversation by uh, saying this is not me telling you how you should play the game. This is just me telling you how I should pl how um, I play the game. But uh, anyway, I thought I'd start off by giving you a look at my ships. So I have a Brigantine and a Snow, which I'm running as my main ships right now. The Brigantine is my kind of real work in progress. Um, so the Brigantine has a benefit for being the fastest ship, as well as having a, ra a ram uh, damage buff. Um, I am focusing on uh, making sure that the damage type that I'm doing kind of all is consistent across the board. So for this ship, I'm focusing specifically on flooding damage. So you'll see that I've got uh, torpedoes that cause flooding damage. I also have demi cannons on the side that cause, cause uh, flooding damage. As well as on the back, I have tearing cannons just in case I'm being pursued. The reason I have them is because I use this ship to do my pickups when I'm going around the Red Isles picking up my pieces of eight because it's the fastest ship and the most convenient one to do it. But all of the weapon types are focused on applying the flooding damage type, trying to keep it consistent. I also on this one have my armor that's kind of broad spectrum just uh, because this, one could, this ship is definitely significantly more fragile than the snow, for example. I'm still working on the furniture choices that I'm running for these ships. I'm trying to find the best ones to kind of equip with uh, each build that I'm going for. However, I, I still feel, even though I've put 30 plus hours into the game right now, that I haven't got enough of the furniture types to really build a cohesive single build for the Brigantine. And I just want to be clear, I'm ignoring all other people's build suggestions. One of my great pleasures in these games is building these things myself. Um, I will occasionally look at other people just to kind of get a idea, but I'll always modify it for my uh my own sake anyway let's look at my snow this is my tank ship and it's by far my favorite ship it's the one i use the most um so for this ship it has obviously the damage uh, sorry the um tank benefit where it can embrace and absorb a lot more damage but i'm focusing specifically on the fire damage type that causes the ablaze elemental damage so i have a bombarder on the front to zam de demis on the port and starboard i have um, long cannons that cause fire on the uh, on the stern, and I have a mortar there with explosive damage, and that's mainly because I don't actually like the rockets. I've been pretty ineffective using them. Um, but this one, I just have the highest buff damage that I have, uh, which is layered scales 5 right now. Um, I'm not particularly impressed with it. I do want to get one of the more exotic armors long term. And again, I'm still figuring out the furniture situation, but again, if it, if it increases the fire or the ablaze damage type that is what i'm running now i know that a lot of people are saying that the brigantine is the best one for pvp but if you are doing a hostile takeover event where you are confined to a small space i cannot stress this enough how much more success i've had with the snow over the brigantine they just last longer and you're able to dish out damage as well as outlast your opponents, especially if you focus on dealing damage to the to your opponents while they're trying to damage you and the other people. Um, since I figured this tactic out, I haven't lost a single PvP event. Anyway, looking at my helm map, just to give you an overview, as you can see, I haven't even finished conquering all of the Red Isles yet, although there is a long-term objective for me to do that. Um, in terms of the manufactories, I'm focusing on the ones closest to St. Anne's and upgrading, so... The two that are directly south are both my highest right now. And then the ones that are just north of St. Anne's are the ones I'm focusing on next. Um, obviously, the higher you get these things, the more efficiently they run, the more pieces of eight they generate, the longer they run for. It's, uh, yeah, it's cumulative. So focusing on the ones that are nearest to St. Anne's just seems smart and convenient to kind of get the pieces rolling in. Now, even if you don't plan on running all the manufactories, it's still worth taking the opportunity to capture them all because for each region where you capture all the manufactories, you do get a percentage bonus increase. If you look at the top of the uh, map right now, you can see there's a little buff for each area that you have. So it's definitely worth getting them, even if you're not going to run all of them. Now, the next thing I would say is for investing pieces of eight beyond just obviously upgrading each manufactory the next best thing is to up, is to get the helm upgrades so that you can start to produce 
the better quantity, uh, better quality goods out of your distillery and your um, opium place on the other side of the map. The reason I do this is because the next tier of rum um, up on the uh, production chart here is used for two things. One, you can sell it to Skurlock to make a lot of silver, which is what I've been doing as kind of a stopgap measure to try and fund the manufacturers because funding more, more and more manufacturers gets more and more expensive and you'll find yourself running out of silver pretty quickly. So if you produce the, I mean, if you, I mean, you can sell any type of the rum to John, John Skurlock, but the higher the refinement, the higher price he pays for it. And for the second tier rum, he pays 250 silver per bottle. So, you know, you can get quite a nice chunk of silver very, very quickly by doing this. Now, you can also buy his special equipment directly from him for the second tier of rum. So you can buy his uh, long nines or the uh, blueprints for his chasers or something like that. Now, um, just bear in mind, when you get when you make your rum in your distillery, it goes directly into your warehouse and you can't sell from your warehouse currently. I hope that changes in the future. It is inconvenient not being able to sell directly from the warehouse and having to uh, move things into your ship's cargo so that you can readily sell it. But um, that's a minor complaint at this point. Anyway, um, moving over the rum now will allow me to sell it to John Skurlock, and you'll get an idea of just how much silver you get for doing this. Um, I know a couple of people have used this tactic and kind of pushed their silver right up to the top. I'm not one of these people who will try and engage one level of the game um, focused for like a couple of hours to try and progress everything else. I like to do things in kind of a rhythm. So I will go out and collect the uh, the sugar cane that I need for the rum. I'll start it build, I'll start the distillery making rum. I'll go around. I'll do some world events. I'll collect pieces of eight. I'll, I'll try and engage in as much PvP as I can do because that has been the most enjoyable aspect of the end game for me so far. Um, not that I've had much success. Um, I you know continue to learn at this game like everybody else. But overall... I feel like one of the traps with this game right now, particularly in its first week, is that I don't think the devs expected us to reach the end game, the level of the end game we've all reached as quickly as we have. I mean, it's not a it's not a particularly long campaign to get to Kingpin, so I I, I, may, I could be wrong about this, but one of the real challenges of keeping people engaged in this game long term will be having good, ongoing, meaningful, dynamic content. So, season one is bringing a lot of a lot of new things. So it's bringing a new main target. It's bringing new types of ships. It's bringing new furniture, new weapons. But I hope that during the course of season one, there are mini events that take place that kind of shake things up a bit. Again, I always refer to the division because I do think the division has a really good model for its live service seasons. So in that game, they'll run an event for two weeks in the middle of the season, like for example the Golden Bullet event that everybody absolutely loves. But that's one of about five different events that they run during the course of a season, and it keeps the game fresh. Now, can they do exactly the same thing with this game? I'm not sure. But if they're able to do stuff like that, it'll keep people having a reason to go back to this game each week and engage with the content and not feel like they're just doing the same thing over and over again. And coming into this game right now with an inactive season it feels like that's what we've been kind of stuck with, especially if you have binged this game and, you know, try to chase your way up the leaderboards. The leaderboards, in my opinion, they're, they're very, very, um, I don't know. It's a tall order to climb the leaderboards. Now, we do have a lot of time to do it, but I'm not one of these people who is going to try and see my name in the top 100 pirates or even the top 1,000 pirates. I just think that will... That will be a detriment to my own enjoyment of a game like this. And I refuse to sacrifice my enjoyment for the sake of pride. Um, but again, play this game as you will. If that's if you feel that that is your objective in the game, have at it. I just uh, I think it will lead to very low-level gameplay, trying to do that, just focusing specifically on capturing pieces of eight. Um, where I think the leaderboards could be improved is if they could factor in different types of leaderboards, like number of player ships killed in a week, or you know, if we eventually do get the clan mechanic 
a uh, number of you know forts or object or you know group events completed or maximum you know plunder and stuff like that there's a number of things they can measure in this game to try and measure success um and use that as a leaderboard metric so they and they and i want to be clear they did say during the uh, the uh, live stream that this is something that they are monitoring and they will be making adjustments to it going forward um but yes, anyway, the other topic on hand today is after trying to figure this out for about a week, I have set up a Discord server for the uh, Star Fury Apollo community that I'm building here. I called it the Den of Fury. I'm going to have the invite link in the description of this video, and I'll put it on my uh, profile on both uh, Twitter and on YouTube as well so people can find it. Um, it's very much in its infancy and I'm going to make mistakes with this. I've never run a Discord community before. So if anybody wants to uh, help me out on this, please uh, reach out to me directly. I'll be uh, glad to take some uh, advice and uh, help with this whole process. But I feel like this type of thing is absolutely necessity right now. As I mentioned in my rant video yesterday, the lack of social tools in this game is proving to be a major problem for this game. And it's isolating players, and it's uh, yeah. We need all the all the tools we can to kind of uh, play this game the way it was supposed to be played. Um, I'm saying all this now. You know, season one is due in a, in less than a week. Things may change within a few days, but uh, this uh, this voice issue, the voice communication issue, sounds like it's a much larger technical problem than they. Uh, than they first anticipated, and there's no guarantee it'll be ready in time for Season 1. Anyway, guys, um, yes, I am trying to be quick and consistent with my Skull and Bones content, so if you like that type of content, please uh, consider giving me a like and a subscribe. Come over and join the new Discord server. And yes, as always, comments, shares, all that stuff is greatly appreciated, guys. I will see you on the seas. Thank you.